The Three Gradual Stages, Volume Seven, Chapter One, Sutra. Ananda, each of these categories of beings is replaced with their own twelve kinds of upside down states, just as the pressing on one's eye produces a variety of flower-like images. Commentary: Ananda, each of these twelve categories of beings which I have just described is replaced with their own twelve kinds of upside down states. Not just one kind of upside down state that I mentioned is specific to each kind. Each category is influenced by all twelve kinds of upside down states. The random thoughts and upside down states arise from falseness, just as the pressing on one's eye produces a variety of flower-like images. If you push your finger up. Against your eye, and then look, you will see white visions. If you release the pressure, the visions disappear. It's because you pursue the false thoughts and upside down states that you cannot get out of rebirth, and you keep revolving in the cycle of the twelve categories of living beings. If you do not follow after the false thoughts or pursue ignorance. But instead, can return the light and illumine within. If you can return the hearing to hear the self nature, then you can break through ignorance, and all that exists disappears. So trap with the inversion of wonderful perfection, the truly pure bright mind becomes glutted with forms and random thoughts. Commentary from the falseness arises the state of being upside down. Which in turn creates false thought in the nature of the treasury of the first come one. Ignorance arises from the basis of truth. One gives rise to falseness. The false and random thoughts are those just described in detail. The original pure and bright mind becomes filled with myriad thoughts that are totally false and unreal. Sutra. Now, as you cultivate towards Certification to the Samadhi of the Buddha. You will go through three gradual stages in order to get rid of the basic cause of these random thoughts. Commentary: Now, as you cultivate towards certification to the Samadhi of the Buddha, you will go through three gradual stages. You must establish three gradual levels and cultivate little by little. Then you can put an end to false thinking and get rid of the basic cause of these random thoughts. Sutra. They work in just the way that poisonous honey is removed from a pure vessel that is washed with hot water mixed with the ashes of incense. Afterwards, it can be used to store sweet dew. Commentary: They work in just the way that poisonous honey is removed from a pure vessel that is washed with hot water mixed with the ashes. Pure vessel means that the jar was originally clean. It represents the nature of the treasury of the first come one, inherent in us all, which is neither produced nor extinguished. The poisonous honey represents people's ignorance and afflictions. The hot water represents the Buddha Dharma, which gradually washes us clean. Washing means to return the nature of the treasury of the first come one to its original form. Afterwards, it can be used to store sweet dew. It can store our genuine wisdom. It can hold the enlightenment to the way. That's what sweet dew represents. Sutra. What are the three gradual stages? The first is to correct one's habits by getting rid of the eight in causes. The second is to truly cultivate to cut out the very essence of karmic offenses. The third is to increase one's vigor to prevent the manifestation of karma. Commentary. What are the three gradual stages? The first is to correct one's habits by getting rid of the eighteen causes. That refers to causes which contribute to the creation of karma. The second is to 
truly cultivate to cut out the very essence of comic offenses. That means to sweep clean the nature of comic offenses that result from greed, hatred, stupidity, and so forth. The third is to increase one's vigor to prevent the manifestation of karma. One progresses in one's cultivation to counteract the creation of any new karma in the present. One does not follow along in the present with one's propensity to create karma. Sutra, what are eight causes? Ananda, the twelve categories of living beings in this world are not complete in themselves, but depend on four kinds of eating. That is, eating by portions, eating by contact, eating by thought, and eating by consciousness. Therefore, the Buddha said that all living beings must eat to live. Commentary, what are eating causes? Some causes aid in the creation of wholesome karma and some contribute to the creation of unwholesome karma. Here the Buddha is referring to causes which bring about bad karma. Ananda, the 12 categories of living beings in this world just described are not complete in themselves but depend on four kinds of eating. They depend on eating to survive, that is, eating by portions, bite by bite, bit by bit. The way beings in the six desire heavens, the asuras, humans, and animals take their food, eating by contact, the ghosts and spirits eat by contact, and some beings in the heavens also eat this way. Eating by thought in the Diana heavens, of the form realm, beings don't have to actually ingest the food. They take the bliss of DNA as food they can eat by thinking. Eating by consciousness, this includes the beings of the formless realm up through those in the heaven of neither thought nor non-thought. They eat by discriminations of consciousness. Therefore, the Buddha said that all living beings must eat to live. That was at the beginning of his teaching when the Buddha wanted to break through the doctrines of externalists. When he said to them that all living beings must eat to live, the externalists laughed at him and said, You call that drama? Do you think we had to wait for you to tell us that? Who doesn't know that beings have to eat to live? Even children understand that. In reply, the Buddha said, Well, tell me then. How many kinds of eating are there? At that point, the externalists were speechless. They couldn't come up with the answer. Then the Buddha explained the four kinds of eating. Sutra Ananda All living beings can live with if they eat what is sweet, and they will die if they take poison. Beings who seek samadhi should refrain from eating five pungent plants of this world. Commentary. This passage discusses the first gradual stage, getting rid of the eating causes, the five pungent plants aid in the creation of unwholesome karma, and so the first step is to eliminate them from one's diet. Ananda. All living beings can live if they eat what is sweet and they will die if they take poison. All living beings refers to the 12 categories. Sweet here really means edible. The food is sweet in the sense that it is not poisonous, but is nourishing and palatable. Poisonous here does not necessarily mean lethal poison, but refers to such things as the five pungent plants, which in this context are considered poisonous. It refers to any food which has an unwholesome effect on beings and contributes to an earlier death. It doesn't just mean eating something which is instantaneously fatal. Beings who seek somebody should refrain from eating five pungent plants of this world. The first step is to get rid of contributing causes. The five pungent plants have been described already. They are onions, garlic, leeks, scallions, and shallots. Sutra, if these five are eating cooked, they increase one's sexual desire. If they are eaten raw, 
they increase one's anger. Commentary: If these five are eaten, are eaten cooked, they, they increase one's sexual desire. Meat has the same effect. If that is one reason why people who cultivate the way do not eat meat, the five pungent plants also increase desire, but not wholesome desire. Rather, they are especially potent in increasing sexual desire. To the point that it is unbearable and one goes crazy with lust. If they are eaten raw, they increase one's anger. They make one more stupid. People with wisdom do not lose their tempers. Those who do lose their tempers, for the most part, are people who cannot clearly distinguish either the principles or the specifics. Something happens and they can't see beyond it. It becomes an obstruction for them, and they do not know how to resolve it except by getting angry. But losing their temper doesn't actually help the situation one bit. Meat also increases one's afflictions and the propensity to get angry. And the more of these five pungent plants one eats, the bigger one's temper grows. Sutra. Therefore, even if people in this world who eat pungent plants can espouse the twelve divisions of the Sutra Canon, the gods and immortals of the ten directions, which stay far away from them because they smell so bad, however, after they eat these things, the hungry gods will hover around and kiss their lips, being always in the presence of gods. Their blessings and virtue dissolve. As the days go by, and they experience no lasting benefit. Commentary. Therefore, even if people in this world who eat pungent plants can expound the twelve divisions of the Sutra Canon, the gods and immortals of the ten directions will stay far away from them because they smell so bad. This refers to people who eat the five pungent plants, or drink wine, or eat meat. On the other hand. The gods and immortals will protect someone who does not ingest these things. Body odors come largely from what one eats. People who enjoy eating beef, onions, and garlic have strong body odors. Their armpits often stink so badly that they can be smelled a long way off, and no one wants to get near them. There are a number of people who are able to spout on the canon with their own extrav divisions, repeating verses and predictions, interjections, and what was spoken without request, past events, analogies, causes, and conditions. These life expansions and what never before existed, with discussion that is twelve all together. As in Great Wisdom Shastra's thirty-third chapter, memorize the verse and you know the twelve divisions of the canon. But if one's eating is not pure, one's soul listeners will be hungry ghosts. The gods and immortals will not listen. The hungry ghosts are creatures that don't have anything to eat. But after people who don't hold the pure eating eat these things, meaning the five pungent plants and the like, the hungry ghosts will hover around and kiss their lips. After people eat these strong-smelling foods, the other lingers around them and attracts the ghosts. The ghosts boldly, boldly go up and kiss those who partake of the five pungent plants. In an attempt to test what they've eaten, ghosts eat by contact, as they were, and we have learned. As we have learned, so those who eat these impure things are literally in the hands of ghosts who hang around and keep touching them. You may not be one who can see them, but they are really there doing just that, being always in the presence of ghosts. Their blessings and virtue dissolve as the days go by, and they experience no lasting benefit. Plain and simple, this passage says that people who eat the five pungent plants end up in the company of ghosts. Ghosts are their constant companions, even though the people themselves may be oblivious to the fact. Their blessings and virtue thereby decrease, and they end up no advantages at all. 
Sutra, people who eat pungent plants and also cultivate samadhi will not be protected by the bodhisattvas, gods, immortals, or good spirits of the ten directions. Therefore, the tremendously powerful demon kings able to do as they please will appear in the body of a Buddha and speak Dharma for them, denouncing the prohibitive precepts and praising lust, rage, and delusion. Commentary People who eat pungent plants and also cultivate samadhi will not be protected by the Bodhisattvas, gods, immortals, or good spirits of the ten directions, who is referred to here. Whoever eats the five pungent plants, if you eat them, is referring to you. If I eat them, is referring to me. The text leaves the matter open. Why don't Dharma protectors and good spirits guard such people? Because they smell too bad. Referring purity, the protectors avoid the stench and do not come around to guard such people. However, protectors are essential in cultivation, for where the proper resides, the devon does not, but where the proper is lacking, the devon will win the, the advantage. The proper refers to the Dharma protectors and good spirits who guard and aid cultivators of the way. But in this case, where they do not come around, the tremendously powerful demon kings, able to do as they please, will appear in the body of a Buddha and speak a Dharma for them. Seeing an unprotected cultivator, the powerful demonic kings come on the scene and gather him into their retinue. They will answer when they catch you off guard. How great is their power? They can turn into Buddhas. I've advised you that if in the future you obtain the, the Buddha eye, you may see Buddhas come, or Bodhisattvas come, or gods and immortals come, or spirits come. But if they are for real, they will have a light about them that is pure and cool. And when it shines on you, you will experience extreme comfort such as you have never known. That then is a true sage. If it's a demon, it pulls out heat. However, it requires a lot of wisdom to make this distinction. If you lack sufficient wisdom, you will not notice the power of his heat. Of course, the heat is not hot like a fire, but it is the case that the light of a demon carries heat while the light of a Buddha does not. Another way you can tell the difference between a demon appearing as a Buddha and an actual Buddha appearing is to look at the Dharma they propound. Demon kings will go about denouncing the prohibitive precepts and praising lust, rage, and delusion. They will say, don't hold the precepts. That's a small vehicle practice. Those of the great vehicle kill, but is not killing. Steal, but is not stealing. Engage in lust, but is not lust. It's no problem. If you kill, you haven't broken any precept. The same goes for stealing and lust. Don't cling to such a small state. Don't hold to such fine distinctions in your conduct. Violations don't matter. What you do before you receive the precepts does not count as a violation of them. But once you have taken a precept, for example, the precept against killing, it is then a violation of the precept if you commit the act of killing. Why? Because you clean, clearly knew it was wrong but intentionally violated the prohibition. If you receive the precept against stealing, and you go out and still you have violated that precept. You may have indulged in sexual misconduct before receiving the precept against it, but that doesn't count as an offense because it's over and done. But if you conduct yourself in this way after taking the precept, then you violate it. Before you take the precept against lying, you are not in violation of the precept no matter what you say. But once you receive the precept, you can't be irresponsible in what you say. Whatever it is, if you know, you know, and if you don't know, you don't know. You can't say you don't know when you really do, or say you know when you really don't. You can't beat around the bush when you speak. 
The straight mind is the body manda. Someone may think, well, then if I don't take them, I won't commit any violations, right? But now you know that it is better to take them, and if you don't, you are missing the opportunity. If you do not receive the precepts, you will not be able to make any progress, either in your personal life or with regard to the Buddha Dharma. You certainly should continue to make progress, since we know it is a good thing to do. We should receive the precepts and then carefully uphold them. But the demon kings do nothing but slander and tear down the precepts and encourage you not to receive them. They praise sexual desire. It's great, they say. The more sexual desire you have, the loftier the level of bodhisattvahood you will realize. Just take a ushuma. Who had to have two to three hundred women a day, but then later cultivated and became five head vira. So what's the problem? And so they go on. Actually, as soon as he begins praising sexual desire, you should know immediately that he's not a genuine Buddha. As to rage, he says, having a temper doesn't matter. The bigger your temper, the bigger your body. After all, affliction is just body, so it follows that the more affliction you have, the more body you get. It doesn't matter. Lose your temper whenever you feel like it. The demon king praises rage in this way. Delusion just means being stupid and doing things that are upside down. We discussed it earlier. Through a continual process of dullness and slowness. The upside down state of stupidity occurs in this world. It unites with the obstinacy to become eighty four thousand kinds of random thoughts that are dry and attenuated, and the beings without thought turn into earth, wood, metal, or stone. Of course, this doesn't happen to every stupid being. It does happen occasionally. However, but here the demon king praises delusion. He tells you that the stupider you are, the better it is. Because if you are stupid, it will be easier for him to get you to obey his instructions. You fall right in with him. You become one of the retinue of the demon kings. Recently, a book came out of India that specializes in praising the. Tantric practice of men and women cultivating together. This is a book written by demons. Demons praise sexual desire and do not instruct people to put a stop to it. They say that without cutting off sexual desire, one can become a Buddha. But Buddhas are pure, whereas the filthiest thing, the most turbid emotion, is sexual desire. In Chinese, the word for marriage "hun" contains a character which is a combination of a word for woman "nu" and the word for confusion "hun" or dark delusion. So the very word marriage itself says that as soon as one gets married, one loses wisdom. One's life is spent as if in perpetual night, in darkness and impurity. It is as if one was sleeping the days away, and when one is asleep, one is totally oblivious to everything. Just that is stupidity. Chinese characters often shed insight on the meanings they represent. On the other hand, what I just said about marriage is not always the case. You have to be flexible when you view things. You can't be too rigid in your opinions. Although I said the marriage is confusion, you can try to gain understanding within that confusion. You can enter that confusion but not get muddled. Shakyamuni Buddha married, and yet he was the wisest of people. When you just heard that people who eat the five pungent plants are kissed by ghosts, did it alarm you? If you weren't frightened, then you must see it as no problem. If it alarmed you, then stop eating the five pungent plants. If you don't eat them, the gods and immortals will protect you, and the ghosts will leave you alone. If you can marry and stay alert, stay awake, then you won't sink into that confusion. If you enter into the situation, you must not be turned by it. 
don't mistake what I said as meaning that I'm opposed to anyone getting married. I'm just exploring the principle. Sutra. When their lives end, these people will enjoy the retinue of demon kings. When they use up their blessings as demons, they will fall into the relentless hell. Commentary. When their lives end, these people will join the retinue of demon kings. This refers to people who eat five pungent plants because they eat such things. The gods, immortals, bodhisattvas, and good spirits do not protect them. Therefore, the demon kings who possess great power can have their way with them. The demon king appears as a Buddha and speaks demonic dharma to them, praising sexual desire, anger, and stupidity. Having been confused by the demons, these people lose their proper knowledge and proper views and any real wisdom. Instead, they harbor devian knowledge and devian views. The demon king says, sexual desire is good and they believe it. The Buddha told me so. He said, it's no problem. That's called mistaking a thief for one's own son. One mistakes the demon king for the Buddha. Therefore, when their lives end, these people will enjoy the retinue of demon kings. When their worldly blessings are used up, they die and obediently go over to the retinue of the demon king. When they use up their blessings as demons, they fall. They will fall into the relentless hell. Demons also have their own kind of blessings. Once there was a cultivator who recited the name of Amitabha Buddha. However, he was particularly greedy, especially for silver and coal and gold. He did recite the Buddha's name, but that's because he had heard that the land of Antimedlis had ground made of gold, and he figured he could amass a pile of it when he got there. Then one day he saw Amitabha Buddha come. The Buddha said to him, Today you should be reborn in the happy land, and you can take your gold and silver with you. So he put his four or five hundred ounces of gold on the lotus flower that Amitabha Buddha was holding. But before he had a chance to hop on the flower himself, it disappeared, as did the Buddha holding it. Oh, thought the man, Amitabha Buddha likes money too. He runs, he's run off with all my gold. At just about that time, in the household of the donor where he was living, a newborn donkey died. They noticed that the belly of the young donkey was hot and heavy, and when they cut it open, lo and behold, the old cultivator's gold and silver were tucked away inside. At that point, the old cultivator realized how heavy his greed was, and he rejoiced that he had not gone off with Amitabha Buddha, for had he gone, he would have become that small donkey. And he knew that the Amitabha Buddha who had come was not a genuine state. Someone wonders, is there any, is there really an Amitabha Buddha? Of course there is, but because people have devin knowledge and devin views, there are also demons who can appear in the likeness of Amitabha Buddha. Clearly, we should aim to be straight and proper. But how do you do that? Be extremely careful not to be greedy. Anybody who has the idea, he can go to the land of Antimapolis and mine for gold had better wake up fast. Although the pure land may be paved with gold, you can't harbor thoughts of self-benefit and make plans to use it as you please. In cultivation, being off by just one thought can bring about demonic karma. The text says that because people who eat the pungent plants have devon knowledge and devon views, they first become demons themselves, and after that they fall into their house. When will they get out? Nobody knows. Sutra Ananda, those who cultivate for body should never eat the five pungent plants. This is the first of the gradual stages of cultivation. Commentary Ananda, have you been listening? Those who cultivate for body, anybody on the path to body, should never eat the five pungent plants. 
you definitely must stop eating onions, garlic, flakes, scallions, and chives. If you eat these things, you can end up in the company of the demon kings. If you don't eat these things, you can draw the Buddha's retinue. This is the first of the gradual stages of cultivation. This is the first step of progress for a cultivator of the way. In cultivation, one must get rid of the causes which aid in the creation of bad karma. The five pungent plants are one cause which aids the demon kings. You should not regard them as unimportant. The five pungent plants make you turbid and confused. They make you impure and draw impurity, push you together with the retinue of demon kings. For the more impure one is, the better they like it.